Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Georgetown University President John J. DeJoya. Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to Georgetown University for this first USAID Frontiers in Development Conference. We're honored to host this gathering, to be among so many world leaders in government, in academia, and in the private sector, and to support the critical work that will be accomplished here over these next few days. I wish to express my deep gratitude to Raj Shah, administrator of USAID, for joining us today and for his leadership in helping to build meaningful partnerships to foster debate and to encourage innovative thinking through this conference. I'd also like to thank the keynote speaker of our session this morning, Senator Richard Luger, for being here to share his insights on the relationship between development, democracy, and security. Since 1977, he has served with distinction in the United States Senate and twice chaired the Committee on Foreign Relations, which oversees U.S. international assistance. And I know we all look forward to hearing his perspective this morning. This conference could not occur at a more critical moment for the questions facing world leaders, practitioners, scholars of human development. Advancements in areas like information, energy, and transportation have given us new resources for finding solutions to pressing issues like hunger, poverty, access to education, and have enabled unprecedented progress in the work of human development. We can be hopeful. In our lives, we have seen extraordinary achievements. Today, 700 million fewer people across the world live in abject poverty than just 20 years ago. But we're here because despite that progress, it is not enough. Still more than a billion people live on less than a dollar a day. And issues like population growth and climate change continue to create significant challenges to lessening the inequities across our world. Here at Georgetown, we've been deeply engaged in the work of human development. To provide just a few examples, since 2008, we've been the home for the U.S.-Afghan Women's Council, a public-private partnership created in 2002 by Presidents George W. Bush and Hamid Karzai through their efforts with the Council, which is led by Dr. Phyllis McGrab through our Center for Child and Human Development. We have partnered with the U.S. and Afghan governments and NGOs to support Afghan women and children. In addition, this fall, the first students who enter our new master's program in global human development housed within our Walsh School of Foreign Service and led by our dean, Carol Lancaster, and by Ann Van Dusen, who in addition to her work as a faculty member here at Georgetown, has over 25 years of experience working at USAID. We hope through this program to prepare the next generation of practitioners for the work we celebrate with this conference. This program will complement another new master's program in our Public Policy Institute on International Development Policy. This work exemplifies the ethos that characterizes our university, which is captured on the walls behind, behind me, behind all of this, uh, which are inscribed here. The Latin words, ad maiorum de gloriam in quae hominum salutem. The first part of that phrase is the motto of the Society of Jesus, the order that founded Georgetown, and it translates for the greater glory of God. The second half of that phrase, which has evolved over the course of two centuries here at Georgetown, roughly translates, and for the betterment of humankind. Our community has been defined by this purpose since our founding. We are animated by our mission of educating young women and men prepared to contribute to the world's most pressing problems. And we hope that all members of our community, students, alumni, faculty, can come to feel the same sense of purpose and responsibility that all of you, as policymakers, practitioners, and thought leaders in human development, embody through your work. It's an honor for us to welcome you all here this morning. And it's now my privilege to introduce Raj Shah, who since 2009 has served as our nation's administrator of USAID. Shortly after beginning his service, he was faced with the challenge of leading the US humanitarian response to the catastrophic earthquake that struck Haiti 
in January 2010. Administrator Shah has co-chaired the State Department's first comprehensive review of American efforts in diplomacy and development, which allowed for the creation of a long-term organizational strategy and the implementation of cost-saving reforms. As administrator, he also oversees Feed the Future, a response led by the U.S. government to world hunger. Through that effort, $3.5 billion is being allocated to support locally driven solutions to worldwide hunger and create long-term solutions to food insecurity and mal malnutrition across the globe. He's also spearheading USAID Forward, an ambitious reform effort to strengthen USAID's institutional capacities. This initiative focuses on new partnerships and the innovation necessary to achieve high impact and lasting results. Minister Shah joined USAID after distinguished service in the nonprofit and governmental sectors working with both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, leading a number of important initiatives. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce USAID Administrator Raj Shah. Good morning. And uh, thank you, President DeJoy, for that uh, overly kind introduction and for not just hosting us uh, for these next few days, but for the deep and meaningful partnership that Georgetown has displayed in partnering to produce frontiers in development. Uh, it really has been an, a team effort uh, with the Georgetown staff, the Georgetown team, the thought leaders, and the incredibly experienced uh, diplomats and development experts that are part of the Georgetown family. So thank you very much. I also want to take a moment to recognize that this really is an example of a wonderful public-private partnership with partners like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, and the MacArthur Foundation, all coming together to recognize that development is changing and we have a unique opportunity at this point in time to craft a new approach. If we come together, we listen carefully, and we're more creative in our efforts going forward. Uh, we didn't uh, try this morning uh, to set and set out to produce a opening panel with five female heads of state. Uh, that that happened coincidentally is a signal of the way the world is evolving and changing. We're thrilled to be in the presence of President Joyce Banda of Malawi, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, President Atafite Yayaga of Kosovo, President Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland and currently uh, a global leader in so many regards, and Prime Minister Helen Clark, uh, former prime minister of New Zealand and currently the head of the UN Development Program. Those are just the guests on the next panel, so this is going to be an amazing few days uh, if we all uh, take the approach that we're here to listen, we're here to learn from experts from so many different walks of life, and we're here to celebrate the ideas they have to share with us, ideas that we know we'll hear from talented leaders like Admiral Jim Stavridis. I want to take just a moment to thank Steve Radlett. Steve is our USAID's first chief economist in a while and has helped us instill a culture of discipline around uh, a more quantitative and economic growth-oriented approach to development and, uh, and is responsible, really, for pulling this together. When Steve came to me about a year ago with the basic idea. It was rooted in a very simple concept. And the concept is that never before have we had the opportunity to achieve so much together in global development, in global health, in protecting the world's most vulnerable, and in contributing to our own national security and economic prosperity along the way. But that in order to live up to the promise we have, the promise articulated most powerfully by President Obama and Secretary Clinton when they talk of and take actions to elevate development as part of our foreign policy. In order to take advantage of that, we do have to do some things differently. We need a new partnership model where we recognize that those abroad, whether they are wealthier or less wealthy than our nation, in fact, are our partners with ideas that must and will lead the way to the future. A recognition that partnership requires involving a much broader slice of American society, whether it's entrepreneurs or students who are tinkering with development projects and ideas in their garages, 
or major corporate partners that can bring scale and impact in a fundamentally and transformational way across the globe. It's a recognition that we need to innovate more in how we do our work, that in an age when technology is literally transforming what's possible, we have to be on the cutting edge, even if that means taking some risks and trying some things that are new and different. And it ultimately, as President Chajoya articulated, is about delivering results. And the results we see today are profound. An African growth rate of more than 6%, nearly three times the growth rate experienced in many of the major industrialized economies the spread of democracy and freedom and human rights as embodied in the leaders that we have here this morning. What The Economist just two weeks ago called the largest success story in development recently, which is the rapid decline in unnecessary child death around the world at levels and with a focus that has previously been unheard of, and with an aspiration across our country of people who want to commit themselves to this mission including students at Georgetown and around this country. So our mission isn't necessarily to have all the answers over these next few days. It's to start asking the questions, and we at USAID, on behalf of a community of development experts, are eager to listen and learn and change based on what we hear. Now that leads me to an introduction of today's, this morning's keynote speaker. Everyone here knows uh, Senator Luger and what he has accomplished through his career. He has long been a champion of what's possible when we project America's leadership around the world in the right way, when we tackle the tough problems, whether it's nuclear threat, food insecurity, threats to health and human welfare, or dealing with national security challenges in their broadest and most effective context. In his 36 years of committed service in the Senate, he has helped focus the world's attention on these incredibly challenging problems. Problems many people thought were not solvable, he goes out and creates both the political basis and the operational model to solve them. He's never been afraid of the world's gravest threats and has led the charge on many of them. And he's always realized that our nation's strength lies not just in its ability to wage war, but in our capacity to create peace. For that reason, we are deeply honored to have Senator Luger here. But there's another reason as well. As many people, perhaps in my generation, would recognize that when you aspire to be in the field of contributing on the international stage and to international affairs, Senator Luger has been one of the most powerful role models of success. And I know that this campus, and I know that our administration is packed, administrations on both sides of the aisle, are packed with people who have come to this place of service looking to Senator Richard Luger as a role model, a role model whose efforts will be deeply felt for decades and decades to come. Senator, we're very personally grateful that you're here this morning, and we welcome you to address us. Senator Richard Luger. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it's certainly a great pleasure and a great honor to join you here today in the Frontiers and Development Conference. I appreciate especially being on this magnificent campus this morning with President Jua and with uh, Raj Shaw, for whom I have such a very, very high regard. I want to uh, thank especially Raj Shaw for this kind invitation and his remarkable introduction. As we open the conference, we must recognize the economic challenges that cast a shadow over development opportunities. Let me get my glasses so that I can. Uh, 
These economic challenges cast a shadow over development opportunities, investments, and practices about which you would deliberate. The United States continues to struggle with anemic growth, an unemployment rate of more than 8%. Our national debt today is approaching $16 trillion. Efforts to contain and reverse our budget spiral are complicated by financial pressures from an aging population, lengthening military engagements, and sometimes partisan politics. Many other countries, including some who have been important partners in global development, face even more stringent economic circumstances. Now, amid these financial threats and budgetary realities, it's inevitable that some will question the role of the United States in global development. A few members of Congress argue that all foreign assistance should be eliminated. A larger number would preserve assistance to Israel and some other politically popular elements, but would sharply downsize most development aid. Almost everyone expects that the United States foreign assistance funding will be constrained for the foreseeable future. This may be true, and certainly planners at USAID must be engaged in efforts to squeeze the maximum value out of every dollar available. But I would assert this morning that development assistance, when properly administered, remains a bargain for United States national security and for our own economic and moral standing in the world. Even in the worst of times, the United States remains a wealthy nation with interests in every corner of the globe. Foreign assistance is a key component of the United States national security strategy, especially since the tragic events of September 11, 2001. It's evident that poorly governed states with impoverished populations can pose grave threats to our national security. Nations that struggle with severe poverty and corrupt governance are at greater risk from terrorism and instability. Wars and extended military operations are enormously expensive in lives and in dollars. And we have spent hundreds of billions of dollars in recent years fighting wars and preparing for military scenarios in underdeveloped regions of the world. If properly targeted, foreign assistance programs can mitigate national security risks and improve United States connections to peoples and governments. They may well save huge military expenditures down the road. This is one of the reasons why the Defense Department has been a strong advocate of a robust foreign affairs budget in the United States. But beyond the national security imperative, I strongly believe that no global superpower that claims to possess the moral high ground can afford to relinquish its leadership in addressing global disease, hunger, and ignorance. More than any other nation, the United States possesses a traditional moral identity, and that identity is clearly associated with religious tolerance, democratic governance, freedom of the individual, the promotion of economic opportunity, and resistance to oppression. This set of ideals was espoused in our founding doctrines and reaffirmed through the sacrifice of our Civil War. It was amplified during two world wars in which the United States opposed the forces of aggression and conquest. And it was reinvigorated through the struggle of our own civil rights movement. Our moral identity has been illuminated by an idealistic rhetorical tradition that flows from Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln through Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan to the present day. And rarely do we take a major foreign policy initiative without some attempt to justify it on moral grounds. Rarely are failed foreign policies spared morally-based criticism. 
In making this observation, I'm not claiming the United States is the undisputed moral compass of the world. Rather, I'm saying that no nation is more closely associated with a set of historic moral precepts, and no nation is judged more meticulously according to its own articulated values. As an observer of global affairs for many decades, I believe this is a good thing. And I believe our moral identity is an essential source of national power. Now, despite missteps, the United States has been and still is a force for good in the world. This is indisputable from any objective point of view. In most respects, we have been an incredibly generous nation. We have rehabilitated former enemies like Germany and Japan. We have continued to help the former Soviet Union protect and then destroy the very nuclear weapons that were once pointed at us. We have helped countries such as South Korea and Taiwan move from extreme poverty to impressive prosperity through our assistance and our protection. Our democratic institutions and political and social freedoms have been models for the world. And we have actively helped to nurture democracy in numerous nations. Even Americans themselves do not fully appreciate the international impact of the example set by our transparent political debate and the extraordinary degree of self-examination that accompanies American policy decisions. Our advocacy has been one of the prime influences for human rights improvements throughout the world. It is telling that China and other nations often cite their indifference to human rights issues relative to the United States when seeking to establish economic or security ties with a problematic nation. The United States makes sacrifices every day on behalf of human rights, and our State Department devotes enormous time and energy to, to producing country reports on human rights and religious freedom that are studied around the world. I would assert that as a moral nation founded on moral principles, we diminish ourselves and our national reputation if we turn our backs on the obvious plight of hundreds of millions of people who are living on less than a dollar a day and facing severe risk from hunger and disease. This is not to say that every human being or every country in a desperate circumstance is our responsibility. But the United States must be a leader in forging the global partnerships and developing the most effective practices to achieve development goals. Beyond our own programs, the efforts of other nations and many non-governmental groups depend on the United States for direction, support, and even validation. As we move forward, it is critical for each of us to make these arguments. We should not be hesitant, even in this budgetary environment in the United States, to make the national security and moral cases for pure development assistance. Further, we should be forthright in explaining that diplomacy and developments are two distinct disciplines. Although diplomacy and development often can be mutually reinforcing, at their core, they, they have different priorities, resource requirements, and time horizons. Most obviously, diplomacy is far more concerned with solving immediate problems, usually associated with countries of strategic interest. Although we hope that our development efforts will sometimes yield short-term strategic benefits, this is not their primary purpose. In a developed context, we are willing to take a much larger view of the world and devote resources to countries of less or even minimal strategic significance for the moment. We are willing to allow the diplomatic and national security benefits of development work to accrue over time. And we are willing to engage in missions for purely altruistic reasons. These differences underscore why development must be a goal that is independent of diplomacy, not merely its servant. 
To maximize our development efforts, we will need robust partnerships. While historically, non-governmental organizations and contractors have been natural partners with USAID as implementers, we must go beyond these traditional relationships. We should be expanding coordination with other governments, foundations, corporations, and small businesses, inventors, and others who can contribute value. With partnerships built from the ground up at the earliest stages of program development and sound financial structures for sustaining them, we can leverage scarce resources for maximum results. We also must embrace transparency in foreign assistance programs. We should be forthcoming about where precious taxpayer dollars are spent, what goals they are meant to accomplish, and whether these goals are achieved. Secretary Clinton and Ambassador Shaw made an important commitment to transparency with the development of the Foreign Assistance Dashboard and the announcement that the U.S. would join the International Aid Transparency Initiative. But implementation of these efforts is lagging in my judgment and should be accelerated to demonstrate our full commitment to transparency. This is vital not only to provide taxpayers a clear picture of how the money is being used, but also to reinforce the United States leadership in transparent economic development. Transparency helps level the playing field for United States companies, counters the propensity of resource-rich developing countries toward wasteful spending, and combats the corruption that the World Bank has identified as, quote, the single biggest obstacle to economic and social development, end of quote. Toward this end, the United States government should be moving forward with full implementation of the 2010 Cardin-Lugar Amendment, which requires all companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange to publish their payments to foreign governments for oil, natural gas, and mineral developments. <laughs> Failure to fully implement the Cardin-Lugar language would squander an opportunity to transform the development scenarios of resource-rich countries that are now mired in poverty. Now, while foreign assistance investments often require significant time before demonstrating impact, funding should flow to programs that demonstrate results. Our programs can only produce results when they are developed with results in mind. Now, I raise this point because a percentage of foreign assistance funding to some countries is moving away from traditional purposes, including education, food security, and disease prevention, toward climate change. I've expressed concerns about individual USAID climate change projects and the growing share of these projects within our development budget. I voice these concerns as an ardent friend of USAID and the State Department and as someone who does not attempt to diminish the potential impact of climate change or the opinions of scientific research on the subject. My concern is simply that climate change projects are among the least likely to offer measurable development results and the most likely to be politically motivated. And I don't doubt that some of these projects will produce results and some may be top priorities in the recipient countries or region. I also understand that some climate change projects are focused heavily on food production or disease prevention. But if we accept that development dollars should be going to projects that will produce the most potent and the most demonstrable results for impoverished people, the standard for these dollars is extremely high. If $10 million is spent on climate change projects or in a country suffering from malnutrition and uncontrolled disease, we must be able to demonstrate that those dollars will produce a better result than what, would be, what could be produced through alternative initiatives relative to agricultural development and disease prevention. 
My hope is simply that the USAID and the State Department will be examining proposed climate change projects under these exacting parameters. I frequently have asserted that the United States should maintain a unique leadership role in global food security. Throughout our history as a nation, we have developed fertile cropland, improved efficiencies through technologies and benefits from the Green Revolution, and enormous increases in crop yield. I have seen these on my own farm in Indiana. We have developed efficient systems for distribution of agricultural products for trade and humanitarian purposes. Our agricultural researchers at our land-grant universities are the best in the world, and they continually improve seed production through genetically modified organisms and address the impacts of pests and diseases. We know this sector, and we can perform extremely well in it. We continue to lead the world in our shipments of humanitarian food assistance and have now begun to focus extending our agricultural knowledge through the administration's Feed the Future initiative, which I strongly support. Further, agricultural results are subject to close measurement, and food can be the basis on which other development sectors are built. I believe all of these factors translate into an American comparative advantage in global agricultural development that we should be leveraging to maximum effect. I appreciate very much Administrator Shah's deep expertise in this area. I anticipate even greater food security achievements by USAID in the coming years. I applaud the commitment that each of you has made to global development. Many of you have been engaged in development work for decades under difficult circumstances. I admire your courage, your compassion, your skill as you continue to find new ways to develop results, and as you come together to share that wisdom with each other. I look forward in every way to supporting your work during my remaining months in the Senate and in the coming years. And I say simply, more power to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.